Do you realize you're forgiven this morning? Hallelujah. Does that there alone not produce a peace in your heart that you're forgiven, you're clean? You're not carrying all the charges that the enemy will try and put against your soul. Romans 5, 1 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you experience his cleansing, when you know that you're washed clean, then you know you can be close to him. And I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. If you haven't taken a hold of God's forgiveness, you're never going to feel close to him. If you never feel close to him, then you're never going to feel the peace of God. I'm going to read from Psalm 29, verse 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Let me read that again. Psalm 29, 11. The Lord will give strength. He will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That is I've entitled this message this morning, God is trying to do something in you and through you. Part 7. God is trying to do something in you and through you. Part 7. It has to be the heart of every genuine Christian in this house that God would work in you and through you. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> the great news this morning is <clears throat> God earnestly wants to work in you and through you. So we're not here today that we've got one desire and God's got another desire. God has a desire for your life that he would do something in you and through you. Um, Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon once and he called it the indwelling and outflowing of the Spirit of Christ. The indwelling and the outflowing of the Spirit of Christ. This subject that we're looking at this morning is definitely extremely important. Um, if you have a desire to serve God, if you have a desire to live a holy life, this message is for you today. And the, this series is for you that we're looking at. This morning, this is part seven of a series on this subject. Um, over this past few weeks, we have established a few things. By the way, the main obstacle for God working in you and through you, we've discovered is your flesh, which is your natural, selfish, sinful nature. Amen? We've also seen how God's internal medicine for your flesh is the indwelling, convicting power of the Holy Ghost. God's external Medicine for your flesh is often the tests, the trials, and the tribulations of life. We looked at how God uses the fire and the wilderness to spiritually enlighten us to his truth and make us into what he wants and get us to where he wants us. We've looked in detail at what going through the fire produces in the believer. It burns away the dross or it burns away any known sin. We then looked at what the wilderness produces in the believer. And we found that it to- leaves us totally devoid of any confidence in self. It strips us of self-reliance. And we talked about every one of those men and women of God as they come out of the wilderness had arrived at a place of nothingness. They, they felt totally unqualified, unworthy, and ill-equipped to even speak on God's behalf. Last week... We looked at how this here in turn leaves the child of God desperate for God's presence. This whole experience leaves the Christian totally and utterly dependent upon his presence to to being with them and in order for them to be who they're meant to be and do what they're meant to do, they need his presence. Amen? So, I think we need to just remind ourselves that His presence should be the most precious thing in your life. Is the presence of God the most precious thing in your life? After all, and I said this last week, we're talking about His presence. We're talking about God's presence here. We're talking about having intimacy with God. Last week we mentioned, but we didn't address in detail, the different blessings that emanate from His presence. The first one that we cited was this. 
we experience His peace to comfort us. When we get close to the Lord, we experience peace. And I want to look at this subject this morning. The peace of God. What is the peace of God? What, why is it so important? So, possessing this peace is basically to literally have a calm confidence in your God in the midst of any given circumstance, great or small, difficult or joyful. Be under no illusion. Everything that we enjoy or exercise of any eternal worth emanates from Him. Anything you have today is from Him. Anything that has any merit. So more good news is that peace is your inheritance this morning. Whatever you're going through, peace is your inheritance. But you must take a hold of it by faith. Our main reading this morning in Psalm 29.11 promises... The Lord will give strength unto His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. You can put your name in there this morning. The Lord will bless you with peace. So basically, this is the portion of every believer. It doesn't always come easy because we often carry so much unnecessary baggage and are often too governed by circumstances and people. We also let our feelings and our thoughts dictate our moods. Has anybody here learnt through the journey of life that you can't trust your feelings or your thoughts? I mean, if you trust your feelings and your thoughts, how often are you going to be at peace? You're going to be up and down like a yo-yo. You're going to be like one of those roller coasters down in Disney World or whatever. You're going to be one day you're on a high and the next day you're on a low. Um, and I'm here to tell you that you need to fight for that peace. There's a struggle. There's another promise we find in Isaiah 26, 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou also has wrought all our works in us. Peace is ordained for you this morning. God has ordained peace for you. And if we're honest... We want to function under the many blessings that come with being a child of God, but we often do not want to walk the path that gets us there. I'm going to say that once more. We want to function under the many blessings that come with being a child of God, but we often do not want to walk the path that gets us there. Be aware, we do not gravitate toward the peace of God. We gravitate the other way. Um, we want to worry. We want to be fearful. We want to be anxious. We want to be nervous. We want to doubt. And we want to get troubled. Would you agree? There's something within us that wants to go there. Um, these are natural responses from our natural man. They don't take effort. But it takes effort to go the right way. So I'm here this morning to tell you, when it comes to the subject of peace, you need to be very intentional. You need to be very disciplined when it comes to this subject. You know, we live in a day where many do not know what peace looks like. I, I put it to you, go out there into this world today and talk to people. And most people do not know what peace looks like. They're doing everything to try and gain that peace. But the peace that's out there is not the peace of God. Um, society is consumed with hurt. Fear, insecurities, depression, and hopelessness. But one of the sad things is many Christians within the church lament that they do not feel peace today. Talk to Christians, and one of the things that they'll testify, I just don't feel his peace. But if you push them a little bit, they don't feel his presence either. So I'm here to tell you that his peace comes with his presence. As you draw close to him, you feel peace. So, peace always starts with drawing close to God. If you're not there, you cannot expect to function in the peace of God. The spiritual blessings of God that we all need can only be experienced through Him. Now, when I talk about His presence, I'm talking about Him. I'm talking about being close to Him. But 
This peace that we're talking about this morning, and I want to clarify this, is not a cessation of conflict as the world defines peace. Now let me tell you what the dictionary defines peace as. The, the secular dictionary says this, it's a state in which there is no war or fighting. It's an agreement to end a war. It's a period of time where there is no war or fighting. <coughs> well, that automatically tells you we're in trouble. Because the Christian walk is a war, it's a fight. Amen? So would you agree that we can't go by the secular dictionary and definition of peace? So the question is, is peace simply the absence of conflict? Is it the absence of problems? Can you answer that? So this is not spiritual peace. If you want to buy into the world's definition of peace, then you're going to struggle or be confused because believers encounter many deep, dark, intense battles in this life. We're in a battle at the moment. But I do believe in the midst of this battle, we can encounter peace. Nowhere in Scripture, I said nowhere in Scripture, does it say that we're going to get it easy or that we're going to be exempt from difficult times. Quite the opposite. That's because we live in a hostile world that is opposed to everything we stand for. Listen to Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 4, 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Isn't that powerful? By the way, we're getting to the heart of what peace says here. We should never consider our own suffering as grounds to question God when suffering is what He promises His people throughout the Word of God. Amen. Let me say that once more. We should never consider our own suffering as grounds to question God when suffering is what He promises His people throughout the Word of God. I was talking last night to my friend Davy, and we're just talking over, over the, a lot of the things that's happening at the moment. And he said something to me last night. And Les quoted it word for word as if he had been listening to our conversation last night in the prayer meeting. And Les said something like this to this effect this morning in his prayer. The cross looked like the greatest disaster in history, but it ended up the most glorious victory. Davy said that last night and Les said it this morning. And I believe that that's a word for Jesse and Josie this morning. That's a word for you and me this morning because things are confirmed on the mouth of two or three witnesses. Would you agree? How did the cross look when you're standing there on day one? Think of you're a follower of Christ. How do you feel on that day? How does it look? They've just taken the Lord and guess what? You're probably next. By the way, Jesus led the disciples into the storm. Cameron mentioned it this morning about the waves coming over the boat. It looked like that boat was about to sink. The the disciples, he led them on. They were led by the Lord Jesus Christ into a storm. It didn't look good. But how did that awful storm come to an end? Jesus spoke. And what did he what did he actually say? We find it in Mark 4:39. He arose, rebuked the wind and said, "Peace, be still." Hallelujah. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Um I think in the last song there there was a line that went like this, I will lift up my eyes to the calmer of the storm. He's the calmer of the storm. He just has to speak and the storm comes to an end. Isn't it lovely to know that today? 
regardless of how difficult or impossible your storm is this morning, Christ is able with a few simple words to calm it. Remember Psalm 34:19 tells us, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Of them all. Amen? Amen. Alexander McLaren outlines that when he says this, Peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. Let's just clarify that this morning, that that is a reality. If you're waiting to everything in your life is smooth, brother, sister, you're not going to experience a calm. There can be a calm inside, like the old timers used to sing, with Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. You can be calm inside, even when everything around you is rocking. Jesus promises in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Christ here contrasts the peace that he gives to that which the world provides. And what he shows is that they're two different types of peace. They belong to two different realms and they produce two different types of effect. Puritan writer back from the 1600s, uh, Thomas Watson, describes spiritual peace. He says this, If God be our God, he will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, he will make peace within. The world can create trouble in peace, but God can create peace in trouble. Amen. Amen. The peace we're talking about is not natural or normal. It cannot adequately be described in human terms. That's why it says in Philippians 4, 7, that this peace is described as the peace of God which passes all understanding. Can you relate to that this morning? The peace that he gives passes all understanding. By the way, this phrase, passeth all understanding, literally means this. It excels, is above, and superior to the intellect of the mind. So we're not talking about something that can be put into human words today. Even though we look through a glazed glass, let us try and establish through our understanding of Scripture what biblical peace is. When you do try to define this, you realize that it's hard to put it into human words. I have a question this morning. Do you have his peace today? Do you have peace with what you're going through today? Do you have any semblance of peace? Or does it feel just like everything's out of control? I urge you, first of all, to seek Him. We're talking about going through the whole experience of coming through, being stripped, coming through, getting the stage of nothingness. But the Lord doesn't leave us in a void. He, he comes and He says, I'm going to take over from now on. You're no longer driving this car. I'm going to drive this car. And as you encounter me, you encounter peace. I think so often we just leave God out of the equation and then we go to bits. I believe as hard at the moment is that we seek Him, get close to Him, stay close to Him, and then as we stay close to Him, we encounter exactly what we need. Amen. Charles Spurgeon testifies, the believer has peace when Christ dwells in his heart and reigns there without a rival so that he knows no man save Jesus only. This peace results from knowing who he is and enjoying him for who he is. It is to know you're at one with Christ. It's knowing God is for you and not against you. It is when you rely upon him for every need and every move. That peace is also triggered from knowing what it says in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Brother, sister, peace comes when everything around us is shaken, yet we know that He's got it all under control. Would you agree? He's got it all under control. This peace comes when there are no barriers between you and Him. 
It is when you have released your sin to him and received his forgiveness. Peace is living in the blessing of God's forgiveness. Brother, sister, I'm trying in human terms to give you a little bit of insight of what produces that peace. We are so blessed. It is known your past is gone and your future is sure. Do you know whom you have believed this morning? Where are you this morning? Do you have that peace or are you dependent upon yourself? Charles Spurgeon again testifies. The child of God receives his peace when a sense of pardon has been shed abroad in his soul. He not only believes his forgiveness from the testimony of God, but he has a personal sense of pardon. Do you realize you're forgiven this morning? Does that there alone not produce a peace in your heart that you're forgiven, you're clean? You're not carrying all the charges that the enemy will try and put against your soul. Romans 5, 1 says, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you experience His cleansing, when you know that you're washed clean, then you know you can be close to Him. And I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. If you haven't taken a hold of God's forgiveness, you're never going to feel close to Him. If you never feel close to Him, then you're never going to feel the peace of God. So that's a big one. Talk to many Christians today that struggle with feeling this peace and they're walking in shame, guilt and condemnation. They haven't released that heavy burden of guilt. And I, I don't believe that you can walk in peace if you're carrying that guilt upon you. It's too heavy. Would you agree? John Blanchard um, describes the peace of God as being grateful for his past mercies, conscious, conscience, conscious of his present mercies, and certain of his future mercies. Amen. That's peace. Can I repeat that? He defines the peace of God as being grateful for his past mercies, conscious of his present mercies, and certain of his future mercies. What I'm trying to tell you is it's hard to put it into words. It's all of the above, but it's much more. Whenever you think that you know all this about the peace of God, the Lord shows you you just know that. That's what it is about these great truths of the Lord. Our peace with God kicks in when you appreciate Him for who He is and what He has done for you. How many times have you felt alone and He's comforted you with His presence? How many times have you been weighed down with the cares of this life and He's whispered a timely word of encouragement in your ear? These are the things that bring peace. When things look hopeless, when things look dark, when it seems like things are going the opposite way to which they should go, and yet you feel them or you hear them, that should be enough to bring peace. Peace be still. He speaks the word. He can speak the word right into your circumstance this morning and your storm can absolutely just be calmed right away. It can be a word in God's word this morning. That just is enough. I want that for a few moments to look at the character of God and look at how He is a personification of peace. I believe this is really important this morning to our study. So He's a personification of peace, but this peace also involves a relationship between you and you and Him. It involves His voice as well. So. A lot of you are very familiar with uh, Gideon in the Bible. And Gideon was faced with a, a pretty dire situation in his day. The miracles had left Israel. The enemy had taken over the ground or the land or the territory that belonged to the people of God. The people of God were hiding. They were up in the hills hiding. Um, but God restored the miracles to that nation. And then after that, he appeared unto Gideon. And we see that in Judges 6.23. And we learn here that the Lord, or Jehovah, said unto him, Peace, or shalom, be unto thee, fear not. 
What words from the Lord in the midst of a dark day? God appears unto his servant Gideon. This incident shows us that encountering God in a personal way is encountering peace. That's because God is peace. You know, we're, we're chasing after peace as if it's some abstract reality out there that is unreachable. I'm telling you this morning, when you encounter him, you encounter peace. He is the peace. He's the peace that you need. I know for me personally, whether it's this past two weeks, whether it's this past few years, whether it's this, since I've committed my life to the Lord, I feel the times where I feel the sense of His presence are the times when peace comes to my spirit. When I don't feel Him, I feel unsettled. I feel vulnerable. I, I feel on my own. I feel like, I feel desperate. I don't know whether you can relate to that this morning. But I'm telling you, when we don't sense His presence, it's not because He doesn't want to be close. It's because we're letting things come between us and Him. That's why we don't have the peace when we go through them. So what's the first thing that Gideon does after the Lord appears to him? He builds an altar onto the Lord. And what does he call that altar? We find it in Judges 6.24. It says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Amen. God is my peace. Isn't that lovely? So he appears, he reveals himself, he manifests himself as Jehovah Shalom. The first thing Gideon does, he runs and he makes an altar and he calls the name of that altar Jehovah Shalom. Wouldn't it be lovely this morning if we were to build an altar unto the Lord in the midst of a storm, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of injustice, and build an altar, not of anger and bitterness and hatred, but an altar of Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. And by the way, this literally means in the Hebrew, Peace is what I am. That's basically what it means. Peace is what I am. It's my character. It suggests Jehovah is the author and giver of true, spiritual, and eternal peace. And by the way, just for interest, uh, that word shalom means this in the Hebrew. Completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. Completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. That's who He is to you this morning. Or that's who He should be to you this morning. When you encounter Him, you should feel complete. You should know that He's got your welfare. That involved in this word peace is, no wonder it's described as a peace that passes all understanding. Because it's all this and more. Um, Charles Spurgeon again said this, this peace is divine in its origin and it is also divine in its nourishment. It is a peace which the world cannot give and it cannot contribute towards its maintenance. By the way, the Old Testament prophets looked forward in history to the common Messiah. And the prophet Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9.6 that this man who was going to come, the Messiah, was going to be called the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Peace is therefore a person. It is only those who receive Him into their life and give Him control of their life who will encounter that peace. The world today is looking to everything and everyone to find peace. Would you agree? I mean, look at what the world's trying to get peace from. Sometimes it's a cigarette. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes it's drugs. Sometimes it's pornography. Sometimes it's Eastern religion. The world is crying out for peace, but they can't find peace because they're looking in the wrong direction. There's only one direction that people will find peace, and that's when you look into the face of Jesus Christ. I'm saying you're surrounded by broken people at the moment. You're surrounded by a confused generation. 
They're looking for peace, but they can't find it. And yet you have that peace. And sometimes we won't open our mouths. When someone complains to you about what they're going through, when somebody's hurting, that's your open door to bring Christ. You know, we've stopped asking people to come to church. We've stopped witnessing whenever we're out there because we're more scared about losing our job. Brother, sister, we need to bring Jesus to this generation. Mm -hmm. When we bring Jesus, we bring peace. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they're going through. You can personally point them to peace. And you can tell them your story. When they say that I'm going to the doctor to get antidepressants, if they're talking about feeling suicidal, if they're feeling hopeless, if someone is ready to give up, you can say, listen, I've got hope for you. I've got good news for you. There's there's a peace that you can experience that will last forever. It's an everlasting peace that comes from the Prince of Peace. Brother, sister, we need to open our mouths and share this good news. This peace is real. If you're truly born again this morning, you know what that peace is. They're trying every fix out there. They're trying every alternative to experience what only God can give. By the way, He's the only one who can change you, change your family, change us, and change America. Do you agree with that? Or do you think the politicians can give America that peace this morning? Do you think there's anything out there that can give America that peace? By the way, we sang another song, Ageless One, You're My Rock of Peace. You're my rock of peace. Is he? Is he your rock of peace? Also, the Old Testament prophet Micah talked about the same Jesus in Micah 5, 2 and verse 5. This is what he said, Thou, Bethlehem, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, and this man shall be the peace. Even the Old Testament prophets knew that there was someone coming who was the manifestation of true peace. No wonder they looked forward to the Messiah. They're constantly looking for Him. Regardless of all the the priests, all the kings, all the judges, all the leaders in the Old Testament, they were all a pale, imperfect signpost to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 says, For He is our peace. I put it to you that there's a clear connection between receiving Christ and experiencing peace. <laughs> By the way, Jesus confirmed this in John sixteen thirty three. He said, In me, ye might have peace. In me. He is the source of all peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stead on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Is your mind focused on him this morning? Or are are you distracted this morning? Is the enemy got your mind away in another direction? Sometimes, when it comes to truths like this, the (laughs) devil can resist it even in the church. I'm saying if there's a subject that we need to take a hold of in this season, it's this subject. Please notice it says here, whose mind is stead on thee. Not on the problem, not on the storm, but it's focused on him. When you're going through a trial, you will either seek him or you'll let the trial overwhelm you. The word, by the way, stead here in the Hebrew literally means to lean upon or to take a hold of. The believer whose mind is stead or centered on God will be at peace. The believer who's not will be all over the place. Many that profess Christ are depressed. They're discouraged. They're deflated. They're despondent. This should not be. Depression refers to a dark cloud governing your mind. Depression can lead to a sense of hopelessness, sadness, torment, or despair. We are not without hope this morning. 
Do you feel His peace? Do you know His peace? Or is there something that's holding that back this morning? As I come to a close, the smart Christian will resist the lie of the devil. He will stop that thought or whatever it is lodging in his mind. And I want to look just for a few seconds here at how do we deal with it when we've got thoughts in our mind that are the opposite to what we're talking about this morning. You find the answer in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Satan wants your mind to be a hive of foolish imaginations this morning. And by the way, if that happens, your thoughts will not have any burn upon the truth. He will have you think black is white and white is black. He will persuade you that your imaginations are a reality. He will try and convince you that your fears will come to pass. He will tell you the truth of God is not applicable to you personally. You could be sitting under the, this message this morning and the devil could be telling you that's not for you, that's for your neighbor. You're not good enough to experience the peace of God. You're not holy enough to experience the peace of God. You haven't been faithful enough to experience the peace of God. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar this morning. That peace is your portion. That peace is your inheritance. You have to fight for it. There's times you have to take a hold of the lie of the devil and say, no, I'm not receiving that. You have to get that thought, that imagination, casting down all imaginations. Every thought in your mind that goes against God's truth, you have to fight it, you have to resist it, you have to reject it in the name of Jesus. If you hold on to that, guess what? You'll be in defeat. Guess what? If you hold on to that, you'll be in turmoil. There will be no peace in your life. It'll just be, you'll be reacting to one circumstance after another circumstance after another circumstance and you're just going to be like this. All over the place. Just like the corn out there blows this way and that way at this time. That's the way you're going to be. Unless you take a hold of it and say, this is where I stand. I stand on the promises of God. Lord, I dare to come close to you. And as I come close to you, I let go of all my concerns, all my troubles, all my fears, all my darkness, all my depression, all the oppression. I let go of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not walking in that. I am not. That is not who I'm meant to be. I am created to be at peace with God. By the way, it's important that you identify what's going on in your mind. Because if you don't identify what's going on, what the enemy keeps hitting you with, then you're not going to resist it. You're just going to receive it and you're going to believe it. By the way, embracing the lie of the devil instead of resisting it opens a door to demonic oppression for the believer and demonic possession for the unbeliever. I know that's hard to receive. But I'm telling you, embracing the lie of the devil instead of resisting it opens the door to demonic oppression. A Christian can be demonically oppressed. A Christian cannot be demonically possessed. But they can be oppressed. They can be absolutely boom, boom, just constantly thump after thump after thump after thump after thump can be unrelenting Unless you say no to the lie of the enemy. And get that thought, get that imagination, and just say no. No more devil. No more devil. That's not my inheritance. That's not who I am. That's not who I will be. And from this moment forth, I choose. Psalm 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Please know God's law here is is describing the word of God, his voice. Albert Barnes says, 
They have great calmness of mind. They are not troubled and anxious. They believe and feel that all things are well ordered by God and will be conducted to the best result. They therefore calmly leave all with him. As a matter of fact, the friends of God have peace and calmness in their minds, even amidst the troubles, the disappointments and the reverses of life. I want to bring your attention to that phrase, great peace. That word great here in that passage in Psalm 119 verse 165, it means much, abundant, abounding, plenteous and sufficient. If you are meditating upon this book, if you love this book, this here tells me that you are going to experience much, abundant, abounding, plenteous and sufficient peace. Now think about this. Those who are captivated with him, we heard earlier, experience perfect peace. But those who love his word experience great and abundant peace. Amen. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that perfect peace? Have you experienced that great abundant peace? So, as I come to an end, where is the Lord trying to lead us this morning? Where is he ultimately wanting to lead you? As a Christian who's in a battle, is in a war. We find the answer in Psalm 23 too. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. This is a picture of peace. This is a picture of tranquility. The sheep grazing and sleeping and lying around the stream. I don't know about you, every time I read this, I just think of tranquility. But that's where the shepherd leads the sheep. That's where he wants to lead you this morning. Not just in the life to come. We know that when we get to heaven, there's going to be no more fear, doubts, turmoil, loss. But he wants in this life to lead you to the place where he makes you to lie down in green pastures and lead you beside still waters. Or calm waters. So I'll close with this. He gives comfort to the weary soul. He gives peace in the midst of the storm. He gives hope when all seems lost. Let us pray. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you have that peace this morning in your heart? Do you have the peace of God that comes with receiving the Prince of Peace? Maybe there's someone here today and you're not right with God. You're not born again. You haven't surrendered your life to Christ. You still call the shots. You still are in the driver's seat. It's what you say goes, not what God says it goes. You could find yourself in this place and hear a sermon like this about peace, but yet leave this place without the peace of God. I wonder is there someone here this morning who's not right with God. They're not living for God. But you've heard this message on the peace of God. And you realize what the word of God says, that he is the Prince of Peace. You realize that he came to this world to die for your sin. So that you could be forgiven. Your heavy guilt, your load of guilt, every lie, every wicked thought that you've went through your mind, every, every cursed word, every wrong action can be forgiven. But you need to be honest with God this morning. You need to be honest with yourself. You need to acknowledge your own guilt and the fact that you can't make it on your own. What is he asking of you? He's looking your life. He's looking your heart. But that means turning from your own lifestyle and turning to him. Let's just, even as believers this morning, can we just seek his face to ask for if there is anything, any impediment between you living in peace and walking in peace, could you just seek his face and ask the Prince of Peace for that peace this morning? Draw close to him and he'll cl draw close to you. When he draws close to you, that peace is the evidence that he's close. Just ask him for the peace of God. Ask him for his strength this morning. I'll remind you of our scripture text this morning in Psalm 29.11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Father, 
We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your truth this morning. We thank you that even in the midst of of mourning, even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of injustice, O oh God, we can still encounter you. Lord, you're not far away today. You're not far off. You're not watching on, Lord. Lord, you're part of it. You're there in the battle with us. You're in the fire, Lord, as we go through the fire. Oh God, I pray just ministered onto every heart peace this morning. Lord, I just pray peace over everyone in this house this morning. That their mind and their heart would be at peace with you. That their spirit would be at peace with you. Lord, that they would just be able to enjoy your presence. Lord, in your presence is peace. True peace, not worldly peace. Lord, you have never promised us the absence of conflict. Lord, that's the world's peace. But you said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. So we take a hold of this true peace that is being at one with you. Lord, let your peace reign in this house this morning and in our families and in the situations we're facing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning.